Today we'll be checking the bead error of this very nice Elgin Verite's 23 Joule pocket watch. Um, it's from a uh, friend of mine who asked me to do some work on it. Um, it has a brand new uh, impulse uh, jewel um, and uh, newly shellacked impulse jewel. It's running uh, pretty solid, almost uh, 300, which is a pretty good amplitude. Uh, it's, so it's in excellent condition. It's keeping great time, but its bead error is very high. So we're going to look at that bead error, uh, take the movement out of the watch, uh, see if we can see down the line uh, between the banking pins and see which side the impulse jewel is on, and then probably take the hairspring off, do a minor adjustment, um, have a look at the uh, bead error again and try to get this thing in beat, and then we'll, then we'll do the regulation of the watch after it's in beat again and see if we can get this spot on again. I had it regulated to plus or minus five seconds a day I think. Um, after three days it was only off by 15 seconds so it was uh, in pretty good condition. Um, it, it was probably a little off in all positions and, and beat error could cause that right so so um, so let's get on with this uh, this job and have some fun with beat error. Fun with beat error that's what I should call this. Fun with beat error. So here I've got my uh, Frederick Constantine um, connected to Swiss Connect software normally um, with this little uh, microphone here clamps onto the pocket watch nicely. It also does watches so it's pretty cool. So if you buy the uh, Swiss Connect software for your iPhone it comes with this mic and I use the mic through a, uh, an adapter and then over to my personal computer and I'm running uh, watch escapement analyzer and timer on this right now. Um, I throw a piece of Rotico underneath the base so I can keep it level while I'm doing that and then um, and that's pretty much the basic setup for doing this. Uh, please don't comment on my dirty mat. I will change this soon, okay? So this is, I think this is dirty mat week. So it's dirty mat week and I'll change the mat, I promise. And I got some other stuff on the go over here. Alright, let's give this a go with the uh, watch escapement analyzer and timer software. I believe it's called eTimer. Um, anyway, this is very high-end software. Here you see the uh, watch signal itself. Um, and there's a threshold. I've got a 15% uh, lock, unlock threshold. Um, and over here, I'll zoom in on this after, but this uh, gives me the, the, uh, the actual uh, pulses or beats here. And the separation here would be the beat error between the two lines. Up here we have the rate of the, of the watch and we have the average amplitude and the bead error being calculated. So let's run it for a few seconds and see what kind of bead error we get. And I think I can chat a bit while this is going on. Um, so the bead error seems to be climbing. It looks like uh, the rate is fairly good. As I told you earlier, it was running, it felt like 15 seconds in three days, so which is excellent. So I was able to get this little, this baby uh, very well regulated. Um, somebody wrote me and told me that it's probably that accurate because when the amplitude is pretty high, um, at two, 265 degrees, um, that means that uh, the bead error isn't as, as much a contributor to the uh, rate as it might be if the amplitude is a bit lower. So, so um, when the uh, watch is, uh, in, when the mainspring is almost wound out though, you're not getting as much power to, through to the uh, to the balance and, and the swing so the amplitude might drop a bit um, and because of that your bead error then becomes more of a, a contributor to the overall accuracy of the watch so you gotta watch watch that so to speak so there we go that's that part there now I'm gonna zoom in on the um, on the, uh, the pulses so you can see what that looks like there you can see the uh, pulses are going by here they are here and they are um, fairly far apart I have to look and see what my zoom factor is here but these are the pulses going by so ideally what you want is um, see it's saying plus plus five milliseconds on that side and plus 13 milliseconds so that's the difference between the two right there and that would be your beat error um, and uh, what ideally what you want is this to be a single line of dots going down uh, plus the uh, vertical lines 
over here, uh, up here, if they're swinging towards the, um, the top is swinging towards the, the right hand side, the watch is running fast. And if it's swinging towards the left hand side, the top part of the line is swinging to the left hand side, the watch is running slow. So this is emulating an, an old time grapher. That's what that's doing. So, um, so what we're going to try to do is get those dots to be closer together and get a decent beat error out of this uh, particular watch. So here we have some data for the uh, eTimer software. It's on the bottom uh, left-hand side of the screen on the software. So it's got a uh, this watch has an 18,000 uh, vibrations per hour. Um, and it's running slightly slow as you can see so 17,998 point whatever so it's running slightly slow right now the lever escapement lift angle is 52 um, I've got a tape feet of 5 that doesn't matter uh, and there's a the measured time and the deviation and there's the number of ticks I've measured here on the system so we've got me go down here and point properly right so there's the uh, deviation and there's the number of ticks so if you look down below here, um, this is the milliseconds to datum. I had figured what that is, but anyway, it's kind of cool. My high pass filter is on to give me a cleaner signal, and my signal to noise ratio is around 35 decibels. Um, and I've got a 48,000 sample rate on this. So that's kind of what I'm looking at here is uh, the important part here is the uh, vibrations per hour running about 17,998. Uh, so somewhere around that so it's running just a bit slow right now um, and as you saw up up in the top it was running around somewhere between seven and eight seconds per day slow which is uh which is pretty good so and with a beat error of around uh, 9.6 milliseconds sorry 7.6 milliseconds that was the uh <clears throat> the beat error on this particular watch so so we'll uh what we'll do is we'll uh, take this watch apart and then we'll see whether we can uh, adjust that and get a better uh, beat error. Well, once again this is the Elgin Veritas pocket watch um, and I'm going to uh, take this out and put it into a movement holder very carefully. I don't want to uh, damage anything I've done already because I did do a good job on this one I think. Um, and uh, It's clean. It's running really well. Uh, and the last thing I want it, it, for this thing to do is have a problem. So I'm going to very carefully uh, remove this pocket watch from the uh, movement. Uh, before I do that though, I'm going to release the power from the mainspring. That way I don't have uh, issues uh, of that nature. As I've done many times before, I'm going to, uh, I'm, what I'm doing now is I'm just taking a toothpick here and I'll put that on the end of the click spring and I'll try to roll that back really carefully because I don't want this particular mainspring to be snapping back fast that would not be good um, so I want to get all the power off the mainspring and I'm taking my time and letting the uh, the mainspring basically uh, wind down here and I want to have that power off as I uh, remove the balance and disassemble it in order to check the uh, get enough of it disassembled to check the banking pins to make sure I have uh, got uh, the see where that impulse jewel is uh, with reference to the center of the banking pins so I can feel the power reducing here on the crown so I just got a couple more turns here and that's it so that's kinda it there I don't feel any more power Let's bring that back a bit so that's nice so the watch, as you can see, it's <coughs> clean as heck because it still uh, it still sort of wants to run even with no power on the mainspring. So that's uh, pretty amazing. Uh, and I'm not sure why it's running, but there is zero power on the mainspring. So I think that might just be left over from the spring uh, bouncing back and forth. This is why this watch is, uh, has become so accurate. So there it's slowing down now. And the... Um, this is a play-by-play -play that could make any person go to sleep. So let's try not to do too many go-to-sleep play-by-plays here. But See, it's still rattling back and forth, but really the escapement's not moving right now, I don't think. And, uh, nope, it's just, the, uh, it's just the watch itself just 
vibrating back and forth so that's pretty cool so I want to uh, to loosen the screws but before I do that I'm going to see if I don't think I have to pull the handle out on this thing early because it is um, lever set so I don't need to do that uh, I just need to remove the, uh, the case screws very carefully here and and remove the uh, movement from the uh, so I turn on a little bit more lighting I turn on a little more lighting here and I uh, so you can see the movement um, it is a gorgeous gorgeous 23 joule Verite's movement so I'm being very careful here removing this back screw um, and I'm waiting for this thing to click so I can um, so I know the screw is I can take the screw out I don't know if it's clicked yet let me check this out not yet so it's uh, I want to make sure there's zero pressure on that screwdriver in case this thing slips down that it would uh, come go down and maybe touch the case so, as I said before you can you can um, Oh, there we go. You can uh, buff these plates out as well. It's uh, not that difficult if you want to make them look a little bit better. But uh, this one, uh, as I've mentioned before, I think in a previous video, it's got gold settings, and this is uh, gold on the wheels as well. So it's pretty high end movement. Um, this would drop out the movement. So I've got to flip this around, and what I'm going to do is set the hands uh, at. 12 o'clock so they're not in the way when I catch the movement so it's uh, just move this back like that and if I do anything here that requires adjusting again I'll fix it before I uh, before I do that so I don't need to remove the hands for this activity so which is good um, so what I'll do is flip that put my fingers on it and then, and then allow it to come out of the movement so of the holder so let's just flip this around um, you're not going to see this really well, so I should probably not even do this on video. But just want to get the movement out, and it falls out face first. Face first, folks. F F F. Face first, folks. There we go. Movement is now out. Like that. So I've got myself a movement holder here, and I want to keep my fingers away, like I said before. Uh, so I can just put this down in the movement holder. This is the world's best movement holder, and what I'll do is I want to make sure that the there's enough edge in here that I don't believe that those hands will touch the edge at all. No, they won't actually. So, so I don't have to worry about the hands being uh, uh, marred or at all by the movement holder. So, I'm going to wind this one in because it's uh, it's very uh, sensitive. So it's going to cry. That's how sensitive it is. And then when I grab this, there's a spring on here that uh, tensions that, um, so I don't have to worry about over tensioning the movement. So that's that's pinched in there nicely. And as a, as you can see, there's right here, there's a little V groove, and that V groove kind of ensures that the whole thing stays in place. And right here is the um, that is the um, arm, the lever set arm for the regulator. So I don't want to mess with that as well. So I'm going to turn that around to to take out the balance. But before I do that, I'm going to have a look um, at this angle uh, with my glasses to see where that pin is sitting and rest. So to see if I actually need to do anything on this watch. Okay, so I've got the watch here in the movement holder, which is kind of nice because it's got some girth to it. And I'm looking at the... Um, Escapement here. Escapement is here, and then it goes through to the uh, the uh, pallet fork uh, pivots, and then over to the jewel. And I can actually see the jewel, and it looks as though the jewel is slightly to the um, to the right. So if I if I move this, I'll show you how much I have to move this. So there we go. There. So that's slightly to the right. I'm looking at the um, the banking pins right now to get that in the center what I would need to do do I tell you is move it this way I believe let me have a look again I'm trying to find the second banking pin here there's the second banking pin uh, there we go there so it's it needs to go this way. 
So from here, it's hugging too closely to that banking pin. So the watch, the jewel, would actually have to go this way, like that. So that would that would put it to the center of the two banking pins. It actually looks like one of the banking pins has been moved as well. So that would do. That would probably do it right there. So so that looks like it's a good. Let me let me uh, pick a point here, an anchor point, and then move it like that. So it's going from. If I look at if I look at focus on. And this um, uh, timing uh, nut here, or bolt, or screw, timing screw here, and then I watch how far it moves. That way it looks like it moves the distance between the two timing screws. So it's like there to there. So, so I want to do around, uh, probably around uh, 4 degrees, maybe 5 degrees. Maybe 5 degrees shift to the banking pin. So it's going, the banking pin needs to go clockwise so the collet needs to go counterclockwise that's how that works so it's uh, maybe counterintuitive but that's how that works so let's uh, let's see if we can do that job all right this is the best job I can do under my stereo microscope you can see the two banking pins there kind of in the center and as I move the escapement or the wheel, you can see the, it moving to the left, moving to the right. So the impulse jewel is is grabbing that pallet fork and moving it. So you can see it's over to the right more, and it's got to move to around there, right? Which is, like I said before, probably around five degrees of movement, which is ever so slight. So, and uh, I believe the banking pins have been moved in a bit because they're adjustable. But I don't want to play with the banking pins. I'd rather just move the uh, the impulse jewel. So it's got to go. So the balance is going counterclockwise. The impulse jewel needs to go counterclockwise, and that means it has to go. Um, you have to turn the the uh, sorry. The impulse jewel needs to go clockwise, which means that you need to turn the uh, balance. Let's zoom in a bit. See if I can get a better picture. The uh, call it. Um, counterclockwise. I'm trying to zoom in on that uh, pallet fork arm because that's what I'm seeing here is a pallet fork arm and it's right in the center there and it's naturally um, resting just over to the right hand side so I move that with my finger I'm grabbing the edge of the balance with my finger and I'm just moving that ever so slightly uh, just to see where I can put that jewel in the center so there you go that's that's the amount of movement it's got to go which is so minor so let's see if uh, that actually causes a huge difference now let's very carefully remove the balance so again the balance actually has to go a few or the impulse jewel has to go a few degrees in this direction um, and I can actually see where the hairspring stud is here is not lined up with that red mark so it was my mistake maybe when I when I put it in that it wasn't completely lined up. It was just off to the side a bit. So if had it been lined up like that, I would probably have had perfect perfect um, a perfect condition. So let me just very carefully remove this um, balance cock. And again, this is a uh, touchy stuff never do this while you're under the influence of anything so here we go and I'm putting that little screw in my screw holder a little balance cock screw holder which is perfect and then I can I believe I can just lift this straight up um, I don't want to uh, stress the hairspring at all so I'll just hold that nice and tightly and then dip it and then move it over like this and place it onto the holder. Trying to find the hole here. There we go. And I've got the little um, 
faux leather carpet here so it's uh, protect the, um, the balance here so it's sitting now on the faux leather carpet like that so I just have to remove again I want to make sure I do this correctly so if I want to move if this thing has to go clockwise just a bit right that means I need to <coughs> let me review this I need to move the collet counterclockwise grab a blank piece of paper here these are old business cards so there we go so so there it is there it's sitting in there right that's where the balance if you looked at the other the banking pins were right here and this thing was over on this side and I got to move it on this side this way which means the balance has to go in this direction right at the end of the day I move the balance that way which means the collet for the hairspring has to go the other direction so it's going counterclockwise so I have to rotate that collet counterclockwise around five degrees so let's see if I can do this carefully and correctly uh, so I want to take the balance off just need to remove the screw and then take the balance off and I don't, probably don't need to videotape all of that because I'll just lose concentration so I loosen that screw nicely and I just have to just poke that poke this down and it drops so there we go so that's the balance now is uh, correctly uh, dropped down um, so I can just move this out of the way now and I've got my balance here so now we've got to just twist that in the other direction so to do that I want to have my metal block here so I so I'm able to hold this thing securely um, I'm gonna see if I can actually twist it um, and I gotta twist it counterclockwise so pick the right hole here to go in That hole seems to fit. I gotta change glasses and be right back. All right, I'm using my flip over, as I've mentioned in another video, my flip over glasses or whatever, my flip over loop. And I've got a greater magnification on this loop than I normally would have. So let me have a look at this. So this has got to go counterclockwise. So the question is, can I get a screwdriver in here and just twist it counterclockwise? Is that, will that work? Um, that's too big a screwdriver. Uh, it would be nice if it would work that way I don't have to take off this so right now you see the balance the stud is lined up here but when it's and it when it's on it looks like it's here and not here so I want to move that so the studs around there so just a bit so I just grab this like this and then twist very carefully I hate doing this by the way there so that I twisted that and as you can see now if I zoom in I zoom in and you can see this not sure but so the red mark the red mark it was right right here and I was able to move it over to right here so that should actually correct that bead error I'm not sure if that's enough to correct it but let's reassemble the uh, the watch and do the test well, there's my setup for reassembling the balance onto the balance cock um, I'll turn the light down a bit here I got a little ramp of Rodico and I've got the uh, balance here and I've got a uh, screwdriver ready and I just moved the balance over very carefully um, lift that up and I don't want to screw this up at all and move the balance over here and what I do is I align that so that the hair the stud for the hairspring is kind of almost vertical and I just rest that on the uh, erotico like that so that the pivot doesn't get damaged at all when I'm doing this and then I'll take the balance here and just put it over the top like this using the uh, stereo microscope and nudge the stud in and make sure that the uh, hairspring is in the in between the regulator pins so that's how that is done so all in a day's work uh, tricky work uh, putting that back so it's always tricky putting it back so I'm dangling it here so I can put on some 
highly or more highly intense uh, loops here to uh, get close enough to tighten that screw again right so and I've got to brace it a bit to tighten that screw because I don't want that coming out so it's uh, again tricky work working with balances is or probably the trickiest part of, of watch making or watch repair or whatever you want to call it it's just tricky that's all it is nothing normally about it just tricky as hell so I want to make sure that that balance is fairly stable so I put my finger on it like this and I can turn that screw and if I can manage to get any part of my other finger on that put a little side pressure on there and just put that in place you don't have to put too much uh, pressure on that screw for it to hold by the way just have to make sure it's uh, in there good so I'm just uh, farting with it here to make sure it's got a grip on the collet keeps slipping out so I'm going to put my finger on the edge here I don't want to touch the hairspring there we go, that was a good twist there. So that's in. So now I have to uh, just put that balance back in, on, on the, in the movement. And what I want to do there is make sure there's a little bit of power in the movement. Or I can enter it from one side and hope for the best. So yeah, I'm looking down at these uh, banking pins and they have been adjusted previously. So. Uh, and there are little marks on where they've been adjusted. So I'm hoping that helps. All this helps. Maybe it won't based on the adjustment of the banking pins, but we'll, we shall see. We shall see. So I'm going to put a little bit of power on the movement, I think. I think. Methinks. Methinks he's going to put some power on that movement. And in order to do that, I need to find out where I put the power in the movement right here. So we're going to get the. Uh, a larger one of these jobby doohickeys see if that fits yes it does so I'm going to wind that up just a bit like so with one of my bench keys and then I want to put that movement in place so the pallet fork is against the left bank right now as I look at it and so I want to enter the jewel. The jewel's on this side. So you want to have the balance entered this way and then turned in to get it in place properly. So, so what I do there is, is grab the balance nice and easy. Like so. Make sure I got a good grip on it. And just leave everything the way it is and move the movement towards the balance. And I want to put that in like this, like that, that, and then I want to rotate the movement here. Seems like it's a bit high, but let's see if I can do that. And you don't want the uh, balance to drop at all. So there we go. Now I'm not sure if that's in place. Well, there we go. So I got myself a tick here, which is good. It's always good when it's ticking. So that's the tick. Now I got to move, get my balance uh, bridge screw. I'll call it the balance bridge from now on, and just put that screw back in place. So to do that, I want to hold this balance down so it doesn't rattle around while I'm trying to do this. And like that one of my bigger screwdrivers. I should have actually changed lens on my loop here. And I'll tighten that balance down, but make sure this doesn't hop around too much. And that's running nicely, so I can tighten it a bit. Like that. And I just have to get a, a mic on that to see what the, uh, the beat error is. So let's try that out. I'm a man of many microphones. So this microphone here is the end of an iPhone and I'll plug that 
into my uh, I'll unplug the other microphone for now because I want to test this before I uh, reassemble here so I can plug this in and I've got too many watches ticking here so around this area on the side over, the, over there there's too many watches ticking away so this could be a problem I'm just going to move these down to the floor so I don't have problems with ticking all right I got it ticking here so I'm going to flip over to the other camera and check out my bead error and see what that looks like so there's some uh, fantastic results I've got the plus 22 seconds per day I can get that pretty close to zero the bead error is 0.84 milliseconds so if you recall before it was 8 milliseconds which is crazy the amplitude is a little low here but I didn't wind the watch up I just did a few turns on the uh, watch so so that's uh, that'll pick up when I when I do a full wind on the watch and I'll test that a little later but that's kind of what we're looking at and as I said before if you look at the little dots they're uh, very close together I'm going to show you that right now all right there's the dancing dots so if you recall these dots were separated by about two of these one or two of these lines I think one of these lines um, which was crazy um, and now they're lined up so if you can if you look at these dots and the ones that are slightly left and slightly right as they zoom in here that is that's the bead error right there so that's an amazing bead error so so I've solved the bead error as you saw I moved the uh, call it counterclockwise slightly I kind of measured it in the microscope seeing where that was with respect to the banking pins and just jogged it over just a little tiny bit and I've got the, the most amazing uh, results from this uh, particular watch so uh, I'm going to reassemble it and then test it again so I'll do a little bit more testing but it looks like it's running 26 seconds a day fast the bead error is 0.69 which is amazing the amplitude's 285 which is way up there which is excellent so I think the job is pretty much done. I'm going to let this run a bit and then I'll try to slow that watch down. It's not going to be difficult to slow down with the, uh, the regulator. So I'll see what I can do here. Okay, the watch is settling in right now. And I don't want to talk too much, but it uh, looks like it's 5 minus 5 plus 3. Uh, I think it's my talking that's causing it. So the last part of this job, I'm going to measure the accuracy of the watch to six positions, not five, using my escapement analyzer software. And let's see what the averages end up being for the watch. I've uh, regulated it a bit, probably could do it a bit more, but, but for now, leave it the way, the way it is and check the bead error averages and everything else. So let's go through that and see where we're, where we're at. So for this job, I'm going to use the, the uh, case, soundproof case that I put together the other day. I got the clip, the Frederick, the Constantine or whatever uh, clip from uh, Swiss Connect software connected, as I said before, and using the watch escapement analyzer software. And I got the watch pinched in there so I get good, good uh, amplitude or volume on that. Um, and then I'll move that to the various positions. So it's... Uh, and I got pen it up, pen it down, all the normal positions I would would have on this watch. The thing is, I'm at a bit of an angle here, so it might not be pen it completely up or pen it completely down, but it's good enough to to get a, a an, an idea of the accuracy of the watch and the beat error. So let's start the job right now. So this is the uh, positional data that I got from the last run, um, and if you look at the um, the bottom here, you see. Um, a rate of minus 14.9 so minus 15 seconds per day in all six positions average and a bead error of 0.99 and an amplitude of 251.9 so 252 and measured to six positions and as I said before uh, you can't really see this but if I show the dots here you can see the dots are 
pretty darn close which is an exceptional beat error that I've got going on uh, the last amplitude is showing here but let's run this again and I'll put the watch in the various positions and you'll see what the data looks like alright so I've selected start now so I just have to hit run and it'll do this for uh, 30 seconds a shot I believe and the case right now is in dial down position so it's uh, measuring this now and it's got a pretty decent beat error right now in dial down 0.78 um, it's uh, running a little fast dialed down so I could probably regulate that some more um, but I want to look at the negative values as well to see what's going on there whether I've got issues uh, from the um, you know it being in the uh, uh, dial up position for example so so uh, and I can talk while it's, this is going on because uh, I got this nice uh, case here that I put together that muffles it all up and I'll show that to you after as well so now I just hit run again so it tells me put the pennant up so so as you see on the side of the box I got them all just in case I'm stupid pennant up is this way so pennant up would be that way so I got the pennant up right now and I'll leave it for a few seconds so it can settle in the pennant up position and then I hit run after it's settled and you can see the bead error is not too bad it's dropping down pretty low actually and the rate is dropping down low so this is if you had it in your pocket and you're walking around with it like a pocket watch um, that's pennant up so it's good it's a little bit of an angle but it's running at uh, 260 amplitude which is excellent and the bead error is way down there point, point 3.5 so it's doing really well from a beat error perspective and the rates is crazy good so that rate is what you'd normally see if you carried this pocket watch around in your pocket you're running it at that level so and now I got to place it in uh, dial down position I think so yeah dial down position so there we go and then I just have to hit run again and see what the difference is there and there will be a difference for sure so and now it's running minus 13 minus 14 so what this is telling me that is that uh, dial up it's a little bit faster and dial down it's a little bit slower but it's only a couple seconds a day so that's pretty good pretty accurate and the beat error is a little higher but not too bad at all and it's only a little higher because it's running at a different a slower rate so probably so uh, and it has to do with where the gears are sitting it has to it's a mechanical device so it's gonna be different in all those positions so now it wants pennant down so that's my PD marker pennant pennant down so that goes in the like this and I let it set settle for a few seconds and pen it down and then run it again and the cool part about this is I can actually chat and it's not interfering you can see there's it's not picking up my voice at all here which is uh, really good at least I don't think it is if I yell loud it will but it, but in this case it's not so this is pennant down I believe and the beat error is actually higher pennant down and the amplitude is a bit lower which means there's a little bit more friction with the pennant down than there is with pennant up or when the when the watch is just sitting there right the friction's the least because it's uh, ticking away but the jewels are either the jewels are flat, flat to the uh, to the horizontal. So, so this is pennant left. So let's go like that. And of course, I got that marked pennant right, but it doesn't matter. Pennant right, pennant left, kind of the same. So I'll sit this like this and see what kind of. And again, there's more friction uh, with with the pennant on the side, which means the watch is kind of like sideways. So, but the the watch would be sort of like that, right? In this mode here, the watch has got the least amount of friction. This mode and this mode here, uh, the watch has got the least amount of friction because all of the shafts are are vertical, right? And and then so there's not a lot of uh, friction with within the jewel of these. But when you go sideways, that's when the friction happens. Even with pen it up and pen it down, pen it left, pen it right, it just it just causes more friction. So let's just hit start on this. and let's see if I'm a liar or not so see, there you go minus 54 52 50 so 
you're getting it slowing down a bit because of the friction in the joules, right? So, and the bead error is not too bad actually. It's around 0 0.1, 0 0.95. So, anything one second or lower is excellent bead error. It's incredible bead error. So, there's minus 36. So, it's improving a bit. So, it's still running a little bit slower. Um, and we'll look at the uh, the results, uh, the averaging results here to, to know whether we got an issue or not. And now we just have to flip it this way, like that, and then hit run again. And in a few seconds this will show the results. Uh, the train is running at uh, 18,000 vibrations per hour as you can see. And here it's running a little slower but not as bad as before. So when the pennant's either left or right it does run a little slower. And that might be the position of the bounce with respect to that. So. But it's not too bad, 17 seconds a day. Amplitude's a little lower on, in this position. And we'll see whether we can uh, we get the data what that means. It'll come up in a few seconds with the results. There we go. And what I'll do is I'll save that as, I already have one saved, but I'll save that in this little annotate positional results. Call it beat error five uh, dash final unless I do some adjustments again but I probably won't so there's final let's save the text and what do we have here so you're looking at uh, dial up at 16 pen it up at plus 4 dial down at minus 13 uh, pen it down at minus 13 and then left and right are, are uh, 41 and 14 um, and the amplitudes are the highest is the dial uh, dial up amplitude at 274 um, and then all the different rates you have here for the beat error. So, and at the end of it, it says that the it's running minus 10 seconds uh, per day on average. Now, if you just had this thing sitting on your on your table or whatever, um, and your dial was up, it might run at at 16 uh, 16 seconds a day, right? You could adjust this, but then it might drive this one. Well, this one you could adjust these two. And yeah, if you adjusted the 16, it might end up uh, making the dial down uh, that much worse from a negative perspective, right? But you would probably never sit it on the table with the, uh, the dial down. It would be the dial up all the time. So, so you could lower that a bit. But then you're probably going to affect these negatives down here. So it's probably best to just keep it this way. Um, and I measured them for a 31 second. You could run this overnight and see what the end result would be in one position and then chart it as well because there's a, a capability with the software to chart it um, in the last position it said the mean beat error was 1.16 on the last position but that was before the button was pressed probably or just as and it ended up being 1.22 so so I'm thinking that the uh, the uh, beat error is excellent on this thing now right so, so <clears throat> anything below one some people are saying anything below two is good but I measured it earlier just with a dial up um, and I managed to get the beat error at 1.02 or something it was stupid low so I'll also run this in my um, Frederick Constantine software and see what it says so so that's that so that's pretty good uh, let me cut, cut this out now all right, I've got my Swiss Connect uh, software all set up. I got the watch set up over here, and I'll just hit analyze and see what happens.
So that's a pretty good result right there, 0 0.5 second millisecond beat error. Um, 248 degree amplitude, which is excellent, and plus 13 seconds per day. And again, that's not in all six positions, that's just up. So I've got one more, and I'll, I'll save this. Um, it's an existing watch, and I'll go under the um, Elgin Veritas watch and hit save. There we go. That's the last result. And then I'll, I'm going to exit out of this and then uh, try one more program. All right, this is the last test with the uh, Tico print, Elgin Veritas 23 Joule, and let's start that test. There's some pretty good results right there. Okay, stop talking. All right, as you can see from the results here, uh, 0 0.5, 0 0.5 millisecond uh, bead error uh, there, uh, and a uh, 0 0.5 millisecond bead error, 270 degree amplitude, which is exceptional, um, plus 13 seconds per day, and that was in face-up position. So very impressed with that that particular result. Um, I'm going to set the watch now and just keep an eye on it for another week and see how accurate it kind of stays, right? So, which is the ultimate test, is just testing the watch. So there we go. There it is. I've set the time on it and I'm going to just place this down. So, Hey there, so today we adjusted the beat error of an Elgin 23 Joule Veritas pocket watch. Um, I had cleaned this pocket watch and replaced or, or shellacked in the impulse jewel. It was loose. Um, so that job was done and the bead error was running around uh, eight plus milliseconds. Uh, it was keeping ex exceptional time in the face up position. And I was kind of concerned to whether I should be uh, adjusting that bead error. And a lot of folks online were saying, well, if the amplitude is high running around 270, and the bead error doesn't matter as much, but when I took a slow motion video of the actual uh, balance uh, with my iPhone, I noticed that it was it was out about uh, probably about 40 degrees in one direction. So it was swinging way further in one direction than it was in the other, uh, which is not good. So it makes timing the watch and all of, in the six uh, positions very difficult. So I dove in, um, disassembled it, uh, and jogged the call it counterclockwise to to uh, move the impulse pin clockwise so you can always got to remember that is that if you see it's too far to the left which means counterclockwise lies looking straight down on the on the movement um, there's the pallet fork and it's too far this way to the left that means you got to move the call it to the right and you can actually pick a point on the balance that you have to point that call it at and that's what i did and i adjusted that bead error then i reassembled the watch and I tested it using my eTimer software, uh, my TicoPrint software, and my Swiss Connect software. And they all told me that the, the job was good. In my eTimer software, you could see the beats. Um, and when there's a huge separation in the beats in that software, uh, you know that there's a major beat error in there. So we were almost uh, able to get that beat error uh, down to a single line. So uh, one measurement had it at like 0 0.3, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, which was crazy good. So. Again, it depends on the position of the watch too. As it's sideways, um, the watch is experiencing more friction 
between the pivots and the jewels so your amplitude might lower a bit um, in that position um, <coughs> and face up face down it's a bit better so so today we did the bead error I uh, hope you enjoyed this video it's probably the most comprehensive one I've made I even used my stereo microscope to uh, to provide a little bit of um, to just show you where that pallet fork arm was sitting between the banking pins which uh, is kind of where the where the uh, impulse jewel was sitting as well so when I did the analysis of how much uh, movement I needed in the collet to adjust that. So that's the bead error adjustment. Adjustment Probably might be the most comprehensive uh, video out there on adjusting bead errors. Um, I've got a lot of books. I've read through the, all these books uh, to see how to do this. Uh, the technique of <coughs> dropping your screwdriver down the center of the hairspring and then twisting the uh, collet from the inside. Um, I find that to be very dangerous because you could slip and ruin that hairspring as well uh, the collet that this collet was a good collet to adjust because I could put the screwdriver in on the side like this and then pull it this way or actually I pulled it this way but so I could do this and I could watch it move um, actually I pulled it this way I can't remember anyway I did I did counterclockwise because it was the impulse jewel was on the other side which was uh, on the banking pins on this side so so <clears throat> when I did this I could I could actually uh, jog it ever so slightly um, and uh, if you go on in through the top like this with the hairspring coil going down um, if you can't get right right through the very top uh, then you end up having to jog it over to the side I saw somebody else online move the whole uh, balance off to the side while the, while the balance the bridge was up here um, and to me that might deform the hairspring you're at risk of deforming the hairspring so you're better off just remove that hairspring stud drop the hairspring down and then, and then adjust it, put the hairspring stud back on, and then put the balance cock fully assembled back into the watch and see whether you've made a significant uh, correction in that bead error. Um, you don't really need to, uh, you can see the, the, uh, the actual uh, pallet fork arm between the banking pins if you look with uh, very, very high magnification. So you really don't need to take the plates off and everything to look at where it is, um, where, the, where the impulse jewel is. Um, if it's in the mouth of the pallet fork and everything is kind of at rest with no power on the mainspring, then it's going to it's going to rest where it rests, and you can see right away whether it's uh, more to the left or to, to the right of center between the banking pins, and you can adjust it that way. So, so my recommendation is to do that. I put another video online yesterday showing me uh, pretty much practicing on a Swiss movement to see. How I would do that and how well it would work. It worked a little bit, but it wasn't wasn't good enough. But I wanted to make sure that I was I was prepared on the Swiss movement. I actually had to jog that call it up a bit. It was way too tight to turn, so I had to jog it up pretty high and then turn it and then and then push it down with a staking with a stake. Um, this time I didn't need to do it. I tried it and the call it wasn't so tight that I that I couldn't uh, adjust it in place. So so be careful of the hairspring. Don't go near that with your tools. You don't want to have to uh, reshape a hairspring. It's nasty stuff, um, and uh, it requires a lot of patience and the right tools to do it. So thank you for watching my video today. It's probably a bit long. I haven't processed it yet, but I suspect it's a long one. Um, please watch it to the end, but you won't know, you won't hear me asking that unless you get to the end, because uh, there's lots of good little tips in there and, uh, on doing this. So thanks a lot, and I will see you next time. Please subscribe to my channel and hit like and uh, lots of comments i love answering the comments uh, and questions and technical questions and that kind of stuff sometimes i have to research this stuff as well so thanks a lot and uh, i hope you enjoy my videos and i'll just keep making them until i'm in the grave <laughs> hopefully we'll be a lot a lot of years from now anyway thanks a lot and have a